Brian Moon. I'm one of the officers at Green Apple, and today we have our first, our fifth annual San Ramon Hackathon um, seminar in conjunction with um, our guest speaker, Duncan, who will be discussing um, painting with bits or using artificial intelligence to create artwork. And before I hand the stage off to Duncan, I'm going to give a quick introduction of our fifth San Ramon Hackathon. So this year's theme is essentially better health, better life. And obviously we're hosted by the organization Green Apple. So let's talk a bit about the origin of the hackathon. So who we are as an organization, Green Apple is a high school run nonprofit organization. We were founded by a group of high schoolers in 2017. And what we do is we organize seminars like these as well as organize the annual San Ramon Hackathon. Our mission is to promote technology and innovation among youth to raise awareness for education among underprivileged children and to introduce young adults and teens alike with opportunities to serve the world via STEM and technology and innovation. So for those of you who don't know what a hackathon is, a hackathon is usually a 24 hour challenge that um, sparks innovation by um, allowing a group of members to come together and create a solution to the theme that is presented by the event organizer. So um, often, um, the members or participants in the hackathon called hackers will arrive in an event where they combine their skills such as hardware, uh, software, and workflow design in order to create a project and present under a panel of judges. And the winner of the hackathon gains uh, gets usually gets a various amount of prizes, but it's also a great learning experience and a great networking experience for young adults. So here are some of the themes for our past San Ramon Hackathon. Um, obviously, uh, during the COVID year, we had the hackathons online and you could see how uh, the themes of the hackathon really relate to the sort of events going on that year, notably 2020 of like virtualization, how to make the world run online, as well as our 2021 theme, which last year we uh, had a competition about tackling misinformation and online encountering online echo chambers. So let's move on to this year's hackathon theme, which is better health, better life. So when we think of this theme, we want to um, sort of analyze different aspects of what is defined as a better health. So there are many aspects of health, such as physical, mental, emotional, and social, and we invite our competitors um, to utilize all these categories as potential starting points for their project. And uh, along with that, um, when designing your project, think of like the age, needs, and personal background of the um, target of the um, target demographic that you want to influence with your project. And to and overall, we want uh, people to think outside of the box and to create projects that could benefit uh, the community at a large. So number one tip is to be creative because the judges will be looking for originality, innovation, as well as the uh, the completion of the project or at what stage the project is when you're presenting it. And you can find some examples of or videos of previous hackathon projects at this website. Um, our website is www.sandramonhackathon.org. So here are just some overall like logistic um, things about our hackathon. So um, rules within the event, a team can only have one to four members and the deadline for uh, this year's hackathon to register will be uh, June 11, 2022. And what you're expected to do throughout the uh, period of the hackathon is to come up with your own um, innovative ideas and they have to be original and can't be um, plagiarized or copied or borrowed from any other source besides yourselves. And materials that um, you should bring are your PowerPoint presentation in order to present to the judges. Um, you should also have an email in order to register along with your team name and your members names. So when you're presenting to the judges, you will have five minutes to present as well as be prepared to answer a two minute um, Q and A from the judges after in order to help them um, score your presentation. 
so the judges have a uh, six row rubric, which uh, caters to these topics. So relevance, um, how well does the solution address the key theme or challenge? Originality, how original or new is this idea that you're presenting? The ease of understanding and your ability to um, deliver this solution to the public. Completeness, what, how developed is the idea and um, how far have you gone throughout this process? Whether the solution is implementable and finally, and finally, the presentation um, and overall passion that you deliver to the judges. So let's talk about awards. The awards for the top three scores will have a $200, $150 and $100 reward. And the judging panel uh, will, const will consist of a lot of industry professionals that are um, expert within their field. And they will be judging uh, and they'll be working together to judge this hackathon. So again, to register, you could go on our website, Santa Ramon Hackathon. Uh, and what we um, invite you to do is sub um, submit a PowerPoint along with your registration or a video. Um, if you can't make the, uh, if you uh, can't make the, um, the presentation date, and if you want to volunteer, you can also fill out our uh, registration form and send us uh, an email. And these are the uh, volunteer opportunities that are available. So again, uh, the hackathon will be held on June 18, 2022. And uh, here's our website link again. And make sure you register by June 11th if you want a spot to um, compete in this hackathon. And in addition to this, we have a um, App Inventor course that is hosted by um, Dr. Mung, who is a um, experienced specialist within coding, as well as has taught many classes in the past. So if you want to attend this class in order to help prepare you for the hackathon, um, then you can also contact this email, which is at hackattack at Green Apple US um, to register for this class, which will go over um, like basic uh, coding through um, MIT App Inventor, which will hopefully help you gain the skills in order to participate in the hackathon. So that's all that I have for you today. And now I will hand the floor to Duncan. And Duncan is a uh, master's graduate from the University of Chicago, as well as currently an AI consultant at uh, Wells Fargo. So he's very experienced in the world of AI and will present, um, I'm sure some fabulous ideas today on his work with painting with artificial intelligence. So Duncan, I hand the mic to you. And um, yeah, thank you for being here today with us. Yeah, thank you, Brian, uh, for that introduction. And thanks, uh, Kelly, for getting me involved um, with this awesome organization. Uh, it sounds like you guys are doing great things. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, a presentation I actually gave um, for my work, uh, which is why uh, Kelly saw it, um, called Painting with Bits, um, Making AI Art with Generative Adversarial Networks. Um, so who am I? So, uh, you know, like Brian said, uh, I'm currently an artificial intelligence consultant um, at Wells Fargo. Uh, previously, I worked at Apple as a data analyst, um, mostly using Python. Uh, and then I am from the Bay. Uh, I actually went to um, St. Mary's in Berkeley, so not too far um, away from uh, your guys' school. Uh, and, uh, you know, proud Bay Area born and raised. Um, for college, I went to UCSB and then UC Berkeley. Um, and then uh, I wish I was a graduate of University of Chicago. I'm actually still uh, doing my master's right now part time as I work. Um, so that's still in flight. Um, and this is actually um, one of my hobbies. So AI art uh, is just something I do in my free time. Um, and it's, uh, so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so just kind of as an outline of what we're gonna be talking about, what are generative adversarial networks? You know, what's kind of the point? Uh, how do they work? Um, you know, how do, they, how do they actually function and do what they do? What can they do? So what are the use cases, both in art, but also in industry? 
um, you know, what to look for in public policy and just in general life. Um, if you were interested in implementing them or working with them, how would you do that? And what was my specific implementation? And then we're going to look at the actual art pieces. Um, and now that, you know, by that time, you're going to kind of know how they got created. Um, and then I just want to open it up uh, for a general q and I've teed up some kind of ethical questions and philosophical questions about what this technology uh, might lead to. So, you know, let's start off with what's a generative network and what's a, a GAN, which is a specific type of generative network. So a generative network is a type of AI that creates some novel data or datum, if you want to be, uh, you know, grammatically specific. Um, a generative adversarial network is a specific type of it that was recently invented by Ian Goodfellow, who um, was one of or is one of the leading members of OpenAI, which is a research uh, group uh, in the Bay Area. And he invented GANs in 2014 and, and published the paper uh, on them that same year. So GANs involve two different neural networks, which uh, we're going to get into as well. They're kind of the premier um, AI or machine learning technology today from multiple different types of use cases. Uh, they involve two neural networks competing against each other in a zero sum game. And once one of them wins, uh, uh, you should train a network. I'm just a reminder to go on mute if you're uh, yeah. you know, just uh, getting some background noise. Um, so how do GANs work? This is a very kind of high level um, image of it, but uh, there's basically two neural networks. One is a generator and the other is a discriminator. Um, if, uh, you know, if you're somewhat familiar with AI or how machine learning works, it relies uh, on data um, to basically train the weights of a neural network to um, accurately have an output. Uh, and how this works is essentially the generator is trying to fool the discriminator. So um, at the start, it just gets random data, which uh, you know in data science is called noise. Um, that noise gets inputted, cross multiplied um, by a lot of weights, which is kind of how a neural network works. Um, and it may spit out a image that does not look like a face at all. Um, and the discriminator kind of has like almost a book of faces that it can look at. And so it kind of knows what a quote unquote face is, or in this instance, a celebrity face looks like. Um, and so if the generator hands it a really bad image of a face, the discriminator um, essentially tells the generator that's not a face, try again. Uh, that happens thousands of times, often millions of times. Uh, and, but it, it has a, that feedback loop of telling the generator, no, that I, you didn't, uh, you didn't, uh, you know, trick me that time. That's not a face that helps the generator get better and better at creating what could be a celebrity face. Um, and you know that the generator is fully trained to make whatever they're trying to generate, whether it's faces or art or, uh, uh text or what have you when the discriminator can't tell the difference between what is, is a real face and what's a fake face. Um, so that's kind of the general training. That's not the usage. Um, and like we said previously, uh, GANs have three components, a generator, a discriminator model, and kind of the plumbing that puts them together. Uh, so yeah, we kind of already went through this. This is the generator and the discriminator. Um, so what can GANs do uh, and generative models do uh, just in general? Um, so there's kind of a myriad of use cases, uh, you know, in the modern economy, creating things, um, you know, and especially creating data uh, is what a lot of jobs are based on and, and what a lot of the economy is based on. So anytime you can automate that process, um, there's going to be a use case. Uh, and then there's probably lots of other use cases that I haven't listed here. But just to kind of go through uh, some of the core ones, so hyper-realistic chatbots. So 
one of the generation uh, use cases is generating text. So taking the input of what a conversation is and generating the next line of what that conversation could be. So GPT-2 and GPT-3 are currently the cutting edge of this. Um, they come out of OpenAI and they are kind of hyper-realistic chatbots um, as well as uh, text generators. Code generation, so uh, GitHub Copilot and there's other uh, companies working on this as well, um, are getting very good at uh, a user telling uh, GitHub Copilot what type of uh, code that they wanna generate. And GitHub Copilot is trained on so much code um, that they can generate pretty good code um, that then, you know, maybe somebody can edit here and there uh, and, and, you know, code an application, uh, you know, from scratch, basically. Uh, deep fakes. So this is one that uh, a lot of people may actually be familiar with. Um, so deep fakes uh, are essentially faking um, either text, speech, uh, or, or images. Um, or, or videos. So uh, there's a very famous one that uh, I have a different slide on of uh, uh, Peel, um, the, the famous uh, comedian, um, basically having Obama say things that Obama would never say um, in a video and, and what you know gets explained in that very viral video is that Obama didn't say those things, but an AI made Obama's face look like he was saying those things while Peel was uh, the voice behind it. Um, and then there's, there's been another very high profile instance of this, which is uh, Anthony Bourdain, the famous chef um, in a recent documentary um, about his life called Roadrunner. Uh, they trained a deep fake on hours and hours of uh, voice recordings of his so that they could have an AI speak like him in order to get clips or, or to get uh, vocal recordings of him saying some of the quotes he'd said in his real life that had never actually been recorded on tape. Um, music generation is a big one. Um, a lot of the, uh, so, so Deep Sym Symphony is a, a, sim a full symphony that AI has generated, but a lot of the pop songs um, that you're listening to today, uh, they may have started um, as an AI, uh, generation and then someone edited them. Uh, what we're probably looking at more towards the future is uh, AI generating more and more music, uh, especially kind of simpler music, um, and then either people iterating on top of those or or just um, you know leaving it as the finished product. Um, you can see if anyone likes lo-fi music or something very simple like that, that would be a, a easy use case that AI could probably do even today. Um, NFTs, uh, so the NFT market just crashed, uh, or, you know, it went down 92%, I think yesterday. Um, but some of the, the, the most famous, uh, NFT collection is the Board Ape Yacht Club. Um, and those were all generated, uh, with generative models. Uh, so somebody trained, uh, an AI model to generate the 10,000 Board Apes that now, you know, or, or were previously retailing for thousands of dollars. Um, Realistic photos. Uh, so the fashion industry um, is actually using uh, these uh, to generate uh, essentially model photos, uh, and then they can superimpose their new clothing line uh, on top of them. Uh, let's see a couple other ones. So Photoshop. Uh, so some of the some of this is just going to be running under the hood of your current uh, you know phone apps or Photoshop or apps like that to just give them new features. So, uh, you know, realistic photo blending, uh, image super imposition, that kind of thing. Um, and then lastly, uh, 3D object generation. So drug generation, protein folding structures, um, those types of things. Um, cool. So uh, we're just gonna go through some real world examples pretty quick. There's a very famous one. There's a, very, there's a very famous website called uh, This X Does Not Exist, which came out of a research paper uh, called This Person Does Not Exist, um, which showed GANs in action and essentially showed very realistic uh, uh, creations of various objects. So cats, people, rentals uh, for Zillow. 
This was the uh, famous Obama use case I referenced. Uh, I do recommend uh, checking this out. Uh, you know, afterward, it's I think it's a great uh, representation of deep fakes and, and why they are uh, a huge ethical concern uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, so Board Ape Yacht Club, again, um, you know, the NFT market is probably not the uh, the, the most stable right now uh, or, or in the future, but um, this is a good representation of, you know, the automation you can get from GANs uh, uh, generating photos in mass. Um, synthetic structured data. Uh, so I actually need to build this slide out, looks like, um, but uh, that's a, a more business focused use case. Uh, and then generative pre-trained transformers, so GTB, GPT-3. Um, this is actually a, a real world, um, uh, snapshot of um, that I took of you know me asking GPT three questions. Uh, so you know uh, I asked it what the meaning of life was, and you know you can kind of read the the meaning of life cannot be definitely said. Some religious people believe in reincarnation, so life has an undefined and infinite meaning. You know, so it it's crafting pretty pretty good, pretty you know realistically human. Um, type responses uh, and kind of getting into the, uh, the realm of what computer scientists uh, and AI researchers usually ter uh, term the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Turing uh, test, uh, which was made famous in Blade Runner. Um, and that's basically, uh, you know, when you're having a conversation with an AI and you can't tell if you're talking to a machine or a human. Um, so uh, this is the mathy bit. I'm going to kind of go very quickly through this, but uh, there is some somewhat complex math um, that goes, it's kind of running under the hood here, um, but uh, we probably don't need to kind of go through that uh, in depth. Um, so th this is uh, my specific implementation that I used. Uh, so the current rage um, in AI right now are very, very large models. So very, very large neural networks um, to the tune of millions and billions of parameters. Um, now that would be a model that uh, any individual without millions of dollars could not create on their own because it takes too much compute time. Um, but there, the current paradigm right now is called transfer learning um, or fine tuning where you take uh, some of these larger institutions, so Facebook, Google, OpenAI, uh, Microsoft, who have a lot of funding, train a model, open source it, which means they you know, put it online uh, for free and basically allow people to use it and change it. Um, we'll put these models online and then you can take those models, you can either use them as is, or you can do a process called fine tuning where you just retrain it a little bit to suit exactly the use case that you're looking at. So, you know, maybe you had a AI model that was very good at, um, at uh, locating, you know, or, or at uh, figuring out pictures of dogs and you could fine tune it to only, uh, you know, determine pictures of Great Danes. So that would be an example of fine tuning. Um, my general technology stack uh, was Python, um, uh, PyTorch, <coughs> Matplotlib and NumPy. Sorry. Um, and I used two different uh, large language models. Um, so Clip and DALI, um, and two different implementations of them Disco Diffusion and a Left2 image. Um, so now we're, we get to the fun part, which is looking at the, <coughs> excuse me, um, looking at the actual art. Um, so the, the interesting thing about this art was the input data was a string of text. Um, so you can see that string of text that I fed it on the bottom. Um, and the AI model was trained on text image pairs. So the AI knows how to go from that, um, that text string and generate an image based off of it. Um, and that's a very novel uh, capability. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and uh, I think it you know kind of shows the power of these models. 
Um, there are kind of ways to, to get better quality images or different quality images. So the input data is very important here. So as you can see, my third, uh, uh, my third um, word there was painting. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of a painted structure. If I'd left off that word, I might end up with a much more kind of sharper lines, cleaner image, not look like a, an oil painting. Um, so let's go through a couple more of these. So this is a castle in the sky. Um, a steampunk image of cogs and you have the kind of top hat there of the robot. Um, and this is a good example of not including that painting uh, word. So you get much cleaner lines um, and not looking like, you know, maybe it was painted in oil or, or some such. Um, and yeah, and this was, you know, a quote from Balzac. And so people have fed this poetry, people have fed it, um, you know, just strings of text that they come up with. Um, I was working with a friend who has a music company called Honey Heist. And so I was generating him some, uh, some Honey Heist, uh, you know, themed images. Um, and then a left to image, which is actually an older technology. And I think it's good because you can kind of see um, how much uh, better the quality has gotten actually in just a year or two, um, which is these were uh, you know much older GANs uh, and much kind of lower quality images um, with, a, with less of a uh, fine-tuned AI. So um, these are kind of just my next steps, um, but I want to save some time for the you know ethical questions and the philosophical questions, and also open it up to QA. Um, so yeah, so some of the ethical concerns with our, these, and there's, there's lots actually, um, are really any AI um, has the possibility of reinforcing systematic bias, because uh, it's only as good as your training data. So if you have training data that is biased, um, whether it is, uh, you know, racially biased or, um, uh, you know, uh, it shows any other type of bias, um, it's going to show up uh, with what the model creates. So that's a, that's a big area of concern. That's a big area people are looking at. When you get models this big, uh, when you're talking millions, billions of parameters, there is somewhat of a black box effect where you're not entirely sure which weights led to that image's creation. So it's harder to debug. It's harder to maybe stamp out those biases or any issues with the model. So that's another uh, issue kind of from a, from a tech side. Uh, deep fakes are, you know, a, a very big ethical issue um, for good reason. Uh, you know, it's, it's tough when we, for, for a lot of our lives, you know, or, and for a lot of humanity, we've kind of, believed in the idea that if I see it, it's real, right? So we see, you know, uh, a video online or an image online, and, and that's, that's, you know, seen as proof. And, and even in courts of law, that's, you know, seen as pretty good evidence. Um, with deep fakes getting better and better by the year, we are getting into a realm where seeing may not be believing. Um, whether the video is true or not, whether the image is, is real or not, um, you, they may become, uh, you know, such fixtures in our lives that we do start to question what's real or what's not. So that is a big area of concern that I'm concerned about, and I think a lot of researchers are. Um, and then is, uh, you know, is downloading and using uh, pictures that have been created with AI stealing, um, which, uh, you know, we're actually going to get into with the philosophical questions later of kind of who made the art that I just showed you. Did I make it or did the AI model make it? Um, and, you know, I think there's an argument on both sides. Um, so for the philosophical questions, you know, who was the artist of this art? Again, did I make this or did, uh, did the large language model make this? Um, there was a, a court case actually uh, a few years ago where uh, researchers tried to grant a generative model uh, legal rights and the judge threw it out of court. They said, no, the, the researchers are the owners of this patent. Um, 
So, uh, but I, I, that's kind of still an open question and it'll be interesting to go through. Um, from, a, from an art perspective, so the, you know, the Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, you know, is, is 10,000 images created by a generative uh, adversarial network. Is that, is, is that art? Is that, um, you know, crafting is, and if it is art or if it's not art, why is that different than say someone like Andy Warhol or Picasso who, you know, reprinted uh, thousands of copies of images or, or, you know, with Andy Warhol, maybe he took a, a central image like a soup can and changed the colors, um, but he didn't change the main image. Um, and then lastly, you know, is what I just showed you, is that actually art or, or is it data or is it somewhere in between? Um, so that is the presentation. Uh, I want to just open it up for a QA session. Um, feel free to ask me anything about this or about, you know, AI or and machine learning in general. Um, I have a question. Okay, yeah. So I was wondering how the AI learns, learns, yeah, using sample data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, AI in general or this specific, these specific GANs? Both, yeah, both. Both, yeah. So most machine learning uses, um, if it uses a neural network, uh, well, and, and so specifically kind of let's, let's start with talking about like statistical learning versus machine learning versus AI. So AI is kind of the more generalized term. Um, it's it's kind of the, the umbrella term. And then below that is kind of machine learning and, or statistical learning um, with machine learning being the kind of main uh, main workhorse right now, which mostly involves neural networks. Uh, for those neural networks, um, they're tr trained by essentially um, a number of weights, which are numbers between zero and one usually, um, getting set at certain levels um, based off the input data. And so I guess a, a really good kind of way to think of this is, um, if I showed you a picture of an apple about 10 times, you would probably start to see patterns of that apple. So the apple, you know, the picture of the apple is generally circular. Um, maybe it's generally red, although there may be some green ones as well. Uh, it maybe has a general shape, um, that, that kind of thing. Um, and neural networks are basically picking up the same thing. Uh, they're just picking it up mathematically. Um, and we don't really have to tell them previously before neural networks um, existed. What uh, AI researchers and, and programmers had to do was essentially tell the computer what to look for. So if they were looking for an apple, I'd have to tell it, oh, it's round, it's, it's about this big, you know, proportionate to other things. Um, at this point now, we can essentially just run a bunch of training cycles um, and the neural network starts picking that up as it goes. Um, in order to do that though, you have to have labeled data. So if I give the neural network um, 10,000 images, I need to tell the neural network which one, of them's which one of them has apples in it and maybe where the apple is. And um, a really good uh, example of this is if anyone has had to prove that they're a human um, with Google lately. So, you know, maybe they, uh, they throw up a nine, uh, nine picture grid and they say, which ones are the stoplights? Um, and, and, you know, you click the five images that have stoplights in them. Uh, and then that proves you're a human and you get to log into the website. Partly what that is, is Google is getting you to label its AI training data for it. Um, so, you know, once you've labeled those images, 
uh, Google now knows these five pictures have stoplights. And so if they want to train an algorithm to, you know, maybe for a self-driving car to find out where the stoplights are, it now has five more images of labeled data with stoplights in it to train that algorithm. I hope that, did that answer your question? Yes. And then the, the one nuance uh, with this one is we, we have two neural networks as opposed to most AI, which would just have one. Um, and the two during the training cycle are pitted against each other. Uh, and so one neural network is trained up to recognize, you know, in, in that example, it was celebrity faces. So it was really good at recognizing what is a quote unquote celebrity face because we gave it maybe 100,000 images of celebrity faces. Um, the other neural network had no training data at all. It just had random noise, which is just a bunch of random numbers that we gave it uh, as input data. And that's really helpful because it means it will never generate the same image twice because that random data is, is randomized each time. Um, and then it went through a training process where it generated just um, an image of maybe nothing or an image of that was not very close to a face. And that other neural network that was trained on face images said that's not a face. They did that, you know, about a million times, and it finally got good at rec at creating things that looked like celebrity faces. Any uh, any other questions? Hey, uh, Duncan, this is Jen. I'm uh, calling from uh, Houston, Texas. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, your AI generated um, painting is amazing. I just wonder that uh, from those um, a couple of sentences you generated uh, the, the paintings, what are your starting point? I, I, I didn't get it. Is it from totally random um, noise or you get some, some other paintings as a starting point? Yeah, great question. Um, so, so I use something called transfer learning. Um, and I used uh, a model called DALI, um, which was a model that um, OpenAI open sourced. Um, and it was a model that, it's a huge model. It's, it's got billions of parameters. Um, and the weights of those billion parameters were trained on um, text to image pairs. So imagine a spreadsheet where the first column was um, a bunch of text strings that described an image, right? So it would be like an image of, a, of an avocado. And then in the second column, um, the, the, there would be a picture of an avocado. That, that's essentially um, how these models are trained. So it goes through you know, millions and millions of training cycles, uh, essentially to weight the, the weight of the neural network to basically pick up on those patterns. Um, and then what you do is you take random data. Um, and so for this, uh, if it's an image, it would be um, each pixel of the image would just be a random data point uh, between zero and one. And then you run it through um, Dolly is essentially what I did. So, so basically you're saying that um, your, uh, what do you call that? The package has, um... Uh, a so-called a name value pair of the sentence corresponding to some image. That, exactly, that was the training data for the, the model, for the AI model, yes. Okay, yeah, so yeah. The, my other question is that uh, you, you mentioned that you have a 12 billion parameters. How, how do you go to those parameters? Um, how does it get to those parameters? Or something? Yeah, how do you get those uh, 12 billion parameters? That's, that's a lot. I remember that um, <laughs> one, um, um, you know, like um, the um, quantum mechanics guys, uh, they are talking about, uh, they said, you have, if I have a 25 parameter, I model the whole universe. You, you know, you have a 12 billion uh, parameters. <laughs> Whatever you want, you can get it. <laughs> Well, I think I think the um, the quantum guy are probably talking about qubits, right? And unfortunately, we're working with just bits. 
And so we can represent way less information than them. Um, but uh, so, so how did I get them? So you bring up a great point, which was I could not train this model myself if I wanted to, um, because A, assembling that much data um, of the, you know, probably millions and millions of image to text pairs that they label that, that they labeled and um, and train this on would be a Herculean task uh, for for me personally or for even a fairly large organization. Um, and then the actual compute time to weight the model um, is huge. And so that's why most of these just ginormous pre-trained models, are coming out of really large institutions um, like you know Facebook or, or Meta, um, uh, Google, Microsoft, uh, and then OpenAI, which is a, a research uh, a research facility that's funded by like Elon Musk and some of uh, Peter Thiel and some of the uh, the early PayPal and and kind of those guys. Um, so then, what what you know normal folks like you and I can do is we can download those pre-trained weights um, offline because they're open sourced and we can either use them as is or we can do fine tuning where we we retrain them but just a little bit to, to fit our use case so maybe maybe I wanted a an uh, a, a painter or an artist you know model like this um, that only painted, these you know, painted similar type images, but they only painted with a different color palette. So maybe I would fine tune it with images that only kind of had that color palette or, or something similar. So is that, is yeah. that kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have another question is that um, the several examples that you showed us yeah. that are paintings, right? I just wonder that um, um, the generated paintings, um, close to what are you thinking beforehand or not are totally irrelevant? It's a great question. Um, sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Um, you know, one thing, one, th there's, kind of, there's kind of different ways you can get a good generation. Um, one is you can really think about, well, well, A, like as you use these models more and more, you kind of figure out tricks. So um, some, some of you may have already noticed, uh, most of my paintings have trending on art station uh, uh, in, in the text string or um, a beautiful painting or, or very kind of like emotive words. Um, the trending on art station is uh, a lot of the text image pairs, they downloaded off, offline. So, um, you know, Pexels or ArtStation or other areas where there were a bunch of kind of open images. Um, and if you kind of go to, and if you, if you include those, you often get higher quality kind of outputs. So if you include DeviantArt or ArtStation or somewhere where folks have uploaded a lot of art, um, you'll usually get better quality paintings um, by doing tricks like that uh, or, or adding in emotive words. Um, Another way to get good quality paintings, and it gets to your question, is um, you can run the model multiple times. So uh, because it starts with random noise, you're never going to end up with the same picture, even off the exact same text string. So I could end up with, I, if I ran this model 100 times, I would end up with 100 pictures of you know a yellow color schema lighthouse. And then I can go through and pick the one or two that I actually want to keep and throw away the 98. Thank you. That's that's a very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, any any other questions? Is this question on the chat? Oh, okay. How do I identify the video image generated by deepfake? This is a great question. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, this is, this is a great question. Um, it's something a lot of people 
are trying to do um, both programmatically, but also uh, to recognize them themselves. Um, the, the unfortunate um, fact is sometimes you can't. Uh, sometimes they just are too good um, that uh, it, it's just hard to tell. Um, and I think that's going to increasingly become um, the case as this technology progresses and you know it's it's kind of one of those things that keeps you up at night right that, that um we could have really really good deep fake technology in the next 10 years um for now though there are tricks um to to catching them and actually this has been in the news a lot lately um because uh folks are using deep fake uh fakes uh people's images to um to recruiting on linkedin to uh, as their profile pictures on Twitter um, and that kind of stuff. And, and that's a pretty easy way to find, to, to figure out if that might be a bot or, or if that might be someone with maybe malicious intent uh, if they're using a, you know, a deep fake uh, profile photo. Um, so just to kind of get, uh, just to kind of show you what that looks like, um, going to, I referenced this website earlier. This is um, called This Person Does Not Exist. And it's a website where if you go to it each time, um, it generates a photo of someone that does not exist. Um, they are, you know, it's a completely uh, AI generated photo. And, and just to check in, you can still see my screen, right? Kelly? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. So, so if we're looking at this guy right now, he looks pretty realistic. Um, you know, it would be hard to tell uh, if I wasn't told, you know, earlier that he wasn't a real person. Um, there's a couple tells though. One are um, the AI does pretty badly with hair um, and with general uh, kind of like lines around the hair. You can kind of see the blurriness here and some kind of strands. Although again, that might just be a bad haircut, right? So this is one where you might not be able to tell. Um, there are worse ones though. So let's see if we can get um, a better example. Uh, that's also a pretty good one. Um, one of the main tells is earrings um, or just kind of ears in general. So uh, one thing that AI will do a lot um, if it generates uh, a photo um, generally of a woman, although you know, um, I, I have my ears pierced, so you know, <laughs> it can be, can be anyone, um, but uh, they may generate a photo with two different earrings um, on each side. Um, there's also, so, you know, kind of back here, like what's, what's this, what's going on here? The, the background image is often um, an issue with some of these where there'll be things that maybe look like a face in the background or don't really look like um, anything entirely, you can kind of see they've kind of messed up, uh, the, the model's kind of messed up her chin a little here. It doesn't really have a defined line. Um, so there's, there's kind of tells around the edges, but you know, the, the scary thing is the, the models are getting pretty good where um, those are kind of becoming more few and far between. Uh, and it's, it's tough to, to find out. This is a good actually example right here where um, her hair just kind of cuts off. Um, so they're probably, you know, this is either a very bad haircut um, or the model has messed up, uh, right? So um, this would be a good tell. Um, and if you look at these enough and you kind of become um, more of a, a deep fake researcher, uh, you'll start picking them up like her ears. Um, something's going on here where probably the model is used to having an earring there. And so then it wasn't super good at generating um, that area. And then this is actually a great bad example of um, this kind of half face monstrosity over in the right ear, which you know really isn't anything. That's the model truly messing up. Um, so that's a good example of a bad deep fake. Um, any any questions about that? Uh, thanks for your answer, my question. Uh, another question I... for, oh, sorry. Now you could go. Okay. 
so uh so for the um ai painting for example for the sample um image for training uh, yeah. it might uh, um after training it might have a maybe piece uh, of a window uh, image or something like that uh, sure that is... oh sorry just that is... we're getting a little background so if you're not talking uh if you go on mute um sorry uh keep continue your question okay so uh for the uh training samples uh, uh that's uh, um or the, or the uh, image for the training sample, it might, after training, after the, the generating uh, image, uh, it might have a, a small uh, piece of uh, original image. Is it possible? Or whether they can claim that uh, your image is uh, not all original from your uh, idea or something like that. It's have my uh, purpose uh, piece of my work. Is it possible? Yeah. It is and it isn't. Um, it's actually, it's a great question. Um, so one thing that these large language models um, and just kind of large uh, models can do, which is a problem, is called memorization, um, which is basically that um, if I, uh, it, it gets shown so much training data that um, is of the same thing, uh, that when you, it, a, a good example would be, say I show a model, um, I'm, I'm from Chicago, so the Cubs, uh, you know, are the baseball team nearby. And so maybe I imagine the training data is Chicago um, and the, the image pair is the, you know, so, so the text would be Chicago and then the image pair would be the Chicago Cubs logo. Um, if you show it enough of that training data, that pair, you can kind of overload the neural network um, to like memorize that training pair. Um, and that way, anytime I give it, you know, the word Chicago, it's going to generate something of the Cubs. Um, and it's going to generate, if, if we showed it enough of the same type of images, it would generate very, very close to that image. And then I think, you know, to your point, when does that become theft, right? When does that become, you stole my artwork? Um, and I, I think there's a bit of a gray area there. Um, there's a, there was a really interesting uh, musical uh, uh, lawsuit uh, recently where um, the chain smokers who are, a, you know, a, a, a big um, uh, electronic music artist that, that were very popular, you know, a couple of years ago, and, and I guess maybe still are, um, they had a hit song um, that uh, somebody pointed out really had, had an almost identical melody to a song that was a hit song when they were growing up, when they were like high schoolers. Um, it was a completely different genre. That song was by Death Cab for Cutie, um, which is a, a you know, band that's probably way too old for all of you guys, but was you know, big when I was in high school. Um, that is much more a, you know, emo, uh, alternative rock song, um, you know, and then the Chainsmokers had made this electronic dance pop song, um, but the melodies were so cute, were, were so close that the Chainsmokers had to pay them royalty rights, uh, because it was so similar and the, the idea, and, and it, it didn't go to trial. Everyone kind of handled it amicably. Um, with the idea that the chain smokers, the, the two uh, guys who make up the chain smokers, just listen to that song probably so much in high school that they, uh, they stole it not knowing, essentially. They, they, they recreated the song uh, just kind of unconsciously. Um, and I, I kind of think of this AI art as similar, that um, you create something very, you could create something very similar uh, without really realizing it. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, also brought another uh, question for for consider about the music as a uh, eliminated notes. That means that if we're using the AI, we can eliminate all the uh, possibilities of a melody. That means that if we have all these subsets, everybody cannot claim any 
copyright <laughs> because that will be subset of all your uh, calculation for all the melody, right? It's, it's true, right? Um, yeah, you could, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's something called patent trolling right now, which is the bane of a lot of uh a lot of inventors uh existence which are people will file patents on really generic stuff um and then uh sue people when they try to create uh when, when they try to file a patent uh saying it's patent infringement um and it's it's called patent trolling and it's it's kind of a a, a bad part of our legal system and and kind of to your point you could you could do kind of the same thing where um you could kind of cover all of music, right? Um, and create a bunch of, you know, fake songs essentially, and, and say you're trying to rip off my song. Um, I, I I think it, does that does that kind of is is that similar to what you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. Something similar. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a brave new world, and you know, I think, um, but you know, partly why. Uh, I want to give this presentation is to kind of start raising some of these questions because it's a really powerful technology and like a lot of really powerful technologies, it can be used for good things like making nice art and, you know, creating, uh, uh, you know, new uh, innovative business products and, and that kind of stuff. It can also be used for really bad things. Um, and so it's important that people kind of recognize it and know that it's out there. Uh, any any other questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. What if someone uploads a misleading picture to the sample data? What do you do and how do you do? That's a great question. Um, so so bias, right? So um, that's uh, there's there's different types of bias uh, in AI and, and what you're describing is something called data bias, um, which is what happens if the root data that you're working on um, is biased, uh, you know, in in one direction, um, you know, so um, a good example for this art one was what if I had trained a model that um, I, I said was going to create art, but um, it created, it was trained on a bunch of, you know, very bad images, right? Uh, like like war images or, or, or something where you probably wouldn't want a lot of people seeing that. It's gonna generate those types of images. Um, and so this becomes a really big issue um, with, uh text generation data so let's go back to the gpt3 use case um this your question actually uh is is really in the news right now uh with ai researchers um because a couple different firms so open ai with gpt3 um and then uh facebook meta you know whatever you want to call them um just open sourced a other large language model um, like this, that, that can is really good at generating text. Um, and so it can get used for chatbots, it can get used to write novels, it could get used to write poetry, all that kind of stuff. The issue with it um, is a lot of the training data was trained um, from sources like, or was, was pulled uh, from sources like Reddit um, or sources online that may not have the best uh types of words on them or the best types of uh sentiments right um there may be racist uh sentiments on reddit there may be sexist sentiments on reddit um there may be you know sentiments that are skewed uh in in certain ways like that um and so if the model is trained on that type of data it is going to mirror those types of responses um, so if I, if I gave the model a bunch of racist training data, I'm going to create a model that when I, when I use it for text generation would create a lot of racist out outputs. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> you can kind of imagine, uh, the liability and, and the issues that that could lead to. 
Um, and there, there's what I will say is, you know, for, for people training these models, they're very aware of that. Um, and they're trying to, uh, to kind of block that uh, as much as they can, um, or, or they're trying to block that. Um, you know, it's a question of if they're trying to do it as much as they can, I think is, is up for some debate. Um, and I think that will be an active research area uh, in academia as, as well as uh, private industry in the future because um, th th there's actually a really good example of, of um, this happening in real life. Uh, so Google images uh, that you know maybe some of you guys use and Google Drive, um, which I've actually, as you can see, I, I've hosted this, um, this presentation on, um, created a AI model to look at the images that you uploaded to Drive um, and automatically tag the images with what are in there. And that's called a classification model. Um, and so it basically is a very large model that knows how to pick things out of images, why the other, it could be people's faces, they could be animals, that kind of thing. And you could imagine the utility of that in that if I'm trying to look for that family vacation that we took to New York City, um, from five years ago on my drive, it may be in some random folder that I forgot about. So if I could just string search for New York City and it pulls all those images up, that would be a great tool. Um, and so they created that tool and uh, they installed it on drive and it was working great um, until they found out that um, for images of um, people with darker complexions, uh, and you know, in different ethnicities, um, it was sometimes auto tagging them as monkeys or as gorillas. Um, Google immediately pulled uh, this model uh, from Drive, but that was a great example of um, not enough uh, testing, as as well as you know, not enough rigor done um, to worrying about the training data and to worrying about um, a model that they were putting into production. I, I know that was a long answer, but um, I hope that answered your question. Uh, any any other questions? Okay, um, Kelly, uh, do you want to take it back or? Any other questions from you? Uh, yes, I don't have any questions. I think we're up to the hours right now. Oh, right.